we have uh, Athena Karp, who is going to be our discussion leader. Athena is coming to us live from New York City. Uh, we have Zev Eigen, who uh, is coming to us live from Los Angeles, California. Uh, and Harry Katamo, uh, who I'm going to butcher the name of this city. I apologize, Harry, in advance. Pori, Finland. So a wonderful group of discussants, really talented people. I'm now going to turn it over to Athena. Wonderful. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Peter, for inviting us um, and having us today in what is a, a really important topic. And I think a topic that gets um, misused often applied to marketing um, and, and almost abused um, from a discussion standpoint of the um, really exciting dialogue that, that could happen in this space. So I'm grateful to be joined by uh, Zev and Harry today to um, have a meaningful discussion here. Um, and would love if we can just kick off um, Zev and Harry, if you can just briefly introduce yourselves and uh, just note kind of why is the topic of ethics in AI, um, kind of what, what's the, the core of this discussion in your line of work or in your uh, professional journeys? Yeah, thank you. NAI as a company is breaking the silos between education, labor market, uh, companies' talent need and investment. And basically, the ethics is super important because there are no one language, no one standards, no one goals. And when, when thinking about states, Europe, Asia side, different cultures, and just to avoid misunderstandings is the first step. The second is, can we figure out general ideas? But because we, are, we want to break silos, this is super important to take into account because, well, if we want to break silos, this is the topic. If we don't want, if we want to build a monolith and control all the data, then maybe not that important topic. Great. Zev? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm Zev Eigen. I'm uh, the founder and chief science officer of Syndio Solutions. Uh, we are an HR tech company that helps organizations uh, close the gender pay gap and otherwise uh, help uh, solve problems in the, uh, in the workplace related to fairness and equity. Um, AI is uh, core to what we do. Um, the ethics of AI has been something that um, I've been working on with Athena and others for a really long time. I have a weird background because I'm a practicing attorney. I've been licensed to practice law in the United States uh, in California since 1999 uh, and have worked both in the, in the legal space uh, uh, in-house with 20th Century Fox um, and as, as an attorney and uh, doing expert work um, as well as uh, serving as a data scientist and working uh, on complex analytics and related uh, AI machine learning applications for a really long time, always uh, predominantly in the workspace. So uh, these issues are really um, something I've been involved in for a long time and, uh, you know, core to how we in this community uh, of, among people who are uh, trying to help solve workplace problems using technology, we, we, it's almost part and parcel of everything we do. So anyone who says, oh, I don't care about this issue, uh, maybe they don't care about it, but it's probably somehow related to something they're doing and they don't even know about it. Right. Um, and I think in this area, there, there's always a discussion of by country, by region, by your moral compass, the definition of ethics and what we call ethics has uh, varying definitions. Um, and I think it's a really interesting topic. Zev, you being from a U.S. legal background, predominantly U.S. application, although obviously you work with multinationals. Harry, you coming from a European mentality. I would love to just um, touch on, do you both feel there's differences by region, by country, by continent in, in how we're defining this topic of ethics and artificial intelligence and or how artificial intelligence can and will be applied, you know, people cite often China as a great example of being able to use much bolder technologies, far more automation, end-to-end -end process, um, but with a different, if you will, ethical boundary 
than what we in other countries might have. So would love your opinions on this. All right, do you wanna go first? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Zev, it's all you. Oh, sorry, I thought, sorry. Yeah, so, sorry guys, classic Zoom, sorry. Yeah, I, so I think in general, I think you're right. I think there's gonna be more, um, so let me back up a little bit. So I think for sure there's going to be more adoption of this tech going forward. You know, Athena, you, you, you know, you keyed up something um, when we were talking, when we, the, the panelists were discussing that I think is highly relevant to this, which is how COVID uh, impacts the changes that we're gonna see going forward. Uh, I think there definitely is more, I think you're right. I think there is definitely more um, uh, need for automation in this space. And I think globally, you're gonna see more companies with, with this kind of competing set of ideologies being applied to what is or is not acceptable. And of course, we have more global clients. At Cyndia, we have a lot more global clients. I know Hired Score does. We have a lot more global clients uh, who have different lenses being focused on the same problem. And sometimes even, even at Cyndia, we have folks who are US-based versus um, uh, Asian uh, or European, and they have different approaches to what they want as part of um, uh, the any lens that's a debiasing lens or anything that's looking at the analytics that are coming out of a system uh, to reduce bias. And um, it's really interesting because you see some of this being very country driven and and some and really I'd say there's two things that, that you see coming out of this. One is um, the law like countries trying to legalize or or create legislation that that memorializes ethical obligations around AI, which is really weird if you stop to think about it, right? Because uh, generally speaking, laws um, are a minimum and they set rules. Uh, think about the difference between rules and standards, right? So like a rule, just to you know, level set, a rule is don't drive over 65 miles an hour. That's a rule, right? Because if you're under, great. If you're over, you've broken the rule, right? That's a rule. A standard, by contrast, is something that's more given towards ethical constraints, where it's like, hey, drive reasonably. What's reasonably? Well, it's under the circumstance. Maybe you can go 95. You're on an empty road, go faster. Uh, if it's packed with people, maybe don't go, maybe 35 is reasonable because it's snowing or raining, right? So um, when you start trying to regulate in the AI space and you're up against rules and standards, uh, both because programming languages are more rule oriented, they're less standard driven, they're mostly rules, um, but then you have AI that's moving more towards standard uh, standards in terms of how it's like contemplating processes and evolving. So that black box of standards driven AI is abutting this attempt of legislators to regulate a space and codify ethics, which is like insanely problematic, made more complex by the fact that you have people in the states doing things that are very different within each state. And then across the pond, you have folks in Europe doing different things in Asia, like you're suggesting. So to be honest, the need for this is, is burgeoning as Athena suggested when we were discussing, like I think because of COVID and other factors, and it's, it's coming to a head where you're going to have laws that are going to be problematic, misplaced, erroneous. I mean, anyone who's talked to any legislators, especially in the States, and then I'll be quiet, has seen this where you, you explain stuff to legislators, they really don't understand what this is, and they have a perception of what they think they know what it is, but it's almost often wrong. And they try to extract little pieces from what they know and they know just that it's like looking through a keyhole and making a decision about what's in a room that's how i feel when i talk to legislators so it's a it's a challenge i, I think zeb it actually tees up really well to harry um this notion of for example right now the use of employee data right by companies a lot of the the leadership is saying well to the point that it's for the greater good of the employee and brings them great benefit and helps them then you can use it. But what type of data are we talking about? Does the employee know it's being used? Is it their sensitive data? Are you, you know, making them aware first of its use and this benefit they're getting, or you're just using it to bring them great benefits? So I think Harry is someone building some of these solutions we're talking about, um, and especially in a climate um, such as Europe that is, you know, far more consumer employee aware. Uh, would love your perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely true, and, and couldn't agree more with Sev. I, I think one of our challenges is that we don't have global ethics. Ethics is always defined by the culture or the subculture 
we have ethics for technology we have christian ethics we have well all kind of ethics and it's it's more like code how we behave rather than a rule or or legislation and that makes the discussion really challenging and also the ethics sound so something very abstract and big we should more discuss on on let's say easier concepts like uh data use like you mentioned or uh transparency explainability and i i think in the discussion the second big challenge is that most of the people think that ai is a black box there is a one type of ai that is a black box so-called deep learning systems but the his, uh, history of ai so the ai as a concept is uh, from 50s and ai as a field of study i would say is equally old as psychology so so uh, so we have a long history and, and we have a lot of really transparent AI systems in the world and we can explain the decisions in same details as scientists can explain the statistical results. But the deep learning is a different case and way too often we are talking uh, AI and deep learning as a synonyms and so saying that yeah AI is the black box and it says whatever. Yeah it's deep learning. But then we have a lot of lot of different and really accurate, really modern AI systems that are explainable. And now coming back to your question about the user data. Now, when 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 we go to data use, first of all, of course, the goal for whose good we are going to use the data. And the second is, are the results valid? Because we have so many uh, sad examples when we have misused the data to saying by, that people who have some uh, feature, for example, uh, two big eyes, it means something. And there is no statistical evidence, but somebody somewhere starts to believe the stuff, and then we all run like chickens behind something. And that's exactly the same with AI. Three years ago, if somebody says that AI has defined this, and then most of the people, well, of course it's true because it's AI. Not true at all. Everything must be possible to back up like in science and, uh, and 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 that's why I, I think that transparency and explainability are the key issues because when the when we do some computational decision what it is based on and when we have the explanation then we can start to discuss is this fair use of data because if, if we are just doing more or less random or black box uh, decisions based on something no matter what, what is the aim, it's always very questionable if we can't explain why we end up something. I think most of us have heard, heard this kind of experiments where we have used deep learning methods, deep learning AI, to uh, figure out who is going to be director and who is going to what job. And then, then the system was taught by giving the previous CVs, previ previous uh, stuff about previous directors. And then the biases were there. And then because the biases were there, because we use a certain type of algorithm, we tend to say that AI is doing wrong kind of decisions. We choose wrong training data, wrong algorithm. Of course, the results are wrong. But, but we can do it in different way. Like in science, we don't use correlation for everything. If correlation is not the method we should use, for example, finding differences in group. Correlation is not designed for that, so we don't use correlation for that. And then the same goes for AI. We need more understanding how we can use it, for what we can use it, what are the limitations. And now we are coming back to science. We have forgotten the science, the history of science. And if you have a degree in statistics, you are very good in it, with AI, yeah. even though you don't know deep learning. And I, I, I think in our discussion, the biggest challenge is we are forgetting our history and we are not answering the right questions. But hey, that takes a long time, so. Uh, I can continue this for days. I, I think what's really interesting is, you know, we talk about full transparency, full explainability, and this spectrum of data science techniques, right? Oftentimes, we will use as professionals in this space, you know, the most accurate or the most predictive, you know, or that which gives the clients the benefit that they are seeking of us. And, you know, the way that I view it, and I would love to, to open this discussion with, between you guys especially, 
you know, there's much more, it's, it's less black and white, just like ethics is not black and white and far more of a spectrum from the, you know, perhaps most explainable dumbest systems to the least explainable, most predictive decision, decision engines, right? And then there's oftentimes places in between where you can say, well, is this a subjective decision or an objective decision? If it boils up the, the, the results and then I can vet it and understand it, does it matter that I'm using less explainable techniques? And I think taking this back to talent acquisition and you know, especially this risk profile, you know, that there's a, what is the benefit the client or the buyer wants out of it, which drives so much of what we all build. But then there's also how risky is it to automate, for example, who gets fired versus to just automate whom is recommended out of a sourcing pipeline. So I would love for you guys to just help us better understand how you see the spectrum, how you see these decision trade-offs and particularly in your fields, where do you feel you're using kind of the, the most risky or most bold type of AI versus you've watered it down for the sake of explainability? Zev, if you could maybe kick us off. Yeah, I think it's a great question. And if, if um, folks are watching this in, in, on Zoom at home, which everyone is, but if you're like checking your phone or not paying attention to anything I'm saying, you're listening to my esteemed colleagues, but if you're listening to, if you're not listening to me at all, but you hear just the net, I, I ask you to just listen to the next like 10 seconds, because I think this is like the core of everything that I work on. And it seems so simple after I say it, but before you're like, like you'll, you'll see what I mean. Compared to what? That's it. Compared to what? So almost every time I get involved in these kind of questions or conversations about whether AI is biased, and exactly the question Athena mentioned, like, should we dumb it down? Should we use this method, that method? You always have to, I'm an experimentalist. I'm an, I come from an academic background. You always have to have a compared to what? And I urge everyone when they're evaluating the ethical questions uh, of anything they're doing, have a compared to what in mind. Uh, actually, this is true for anything you're estimating, even if you're estimating the accuracy or integrity of a model. If your model is 30% accurate, but and you go, oh, well, 30%, oh, boo, what a bad model. Compared to what? Like in other fields, not in employment, but in other fields like cancer research, if we, you know, if we got together and figured out that we could predict cancer rates at 1% uh, and we can explain variation in cancer at 1% and, and it's a statistically robust uh, thing, we could publish that in science. But you're only explaining 1% of variation in uh, you know, melanoma or something. But that's such a hard thing to do because there's so many things and our expectation of what you should be able to do is so low. So relative to that, it's amazing. Same thing with these ethical constraints. Ask the question compared to what when you're evaluating whether models are biased or not. Humans are biased and humans make biased decisions. So if before you implemented a system for hiring or talent evaluation that was algorithmic, if humans were making, you have to first measure how biased your humans are. So oftentimes this question that we're posing is in a vacuum and we say, oh no, I ran this model and it turns out it's over selecting a certain category, a protected category. Maybe it's over selecting men. In my world, a lot of this is gender and race. So we're looking at gender and race as protected categories. It's over selecting. And I always run a base rate comparison and I say, well, look, before you ran any models, you were this biased, right? Whatever that level is. Now we're reducing that down using algorithms. Now your perception of whether that algorithm is biased, good, bad, completely changes, right? If I, but with, and this is the same kind of thing with legislators. Legislators say, aha, look, in, when you run this model, it's selecting white men more often than uh, people of color or uh, female people of color. Proof, AI is biased, throw it all out, it's garbage, it's bad. And my response is always like compared to what, you know, we, we, we don't throw humans out because they're once upon a time, a, one human was biased. So we have to have that compared to what, when you're using, when you're trying to select models, even in the question of like whether you water down, whether you use a complex model, simple model, I think the answer to that question, maybe it's a little bit circum, you know, I'm getting around it a little bit, Athena, but honestly, part of my talk track around this is, is the critical question of compared to what, right? Because that's what, you know, people are more tolerant of things if they understand that base rate and they're less tolerant if you're just looking in a vacuum. So I urge everyone when you're evaluating these questions or if you're making, building these models, have that base rate first, which seems like no one wants to do that step too. Everyone's like, just jump in and show me how act, what's the precision, what's my, F? right? No, 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 no. There's a step before that you gotta do to avoid these kind of problems. Yeah, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now, sorry. 
<laughs> and and want, want to add this is this is so important we are we are always talking about yeah compared to what is the is the key but way too often we think that when we have the right algorithm and right data model it's there but uh, also sad truth is that we don't have bias free data and and when it comes to uh, man made data it's definitely biased one, 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 one really good example is that I, I think most of us think that Nordic countries are the most equal countries everywhere. And Finland just had its uh, 100 years independence uh, celebration in 2017. And for that, we run, run a Finnish uh, literature, fin, fin, model about Finnish uh, literature, Finnish uh, writings, all the history. And our uh, model was really biased. There were only one female author included in, in the line of the history. And we were really sad. And so were the audience and audience were really disappointed in fact. But then when, when, when the uh, experienced professors start to discuss that, hey, the outcome is really true. If you have the library system as your background material, you can't find anyone else who is that connected, that cited, that it fits to top 100 model on 100 years. So, so in, in that sense, all the data is biased. And that, that's one fact we have to uh, accept and understand when we are running the models, choosing the algorithms. We have to understand how they are biased. But when saying that we have bias-free data, we are lying. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the um, notion of how can we leverage new technologies, modern technologies, especially in TA, which is in a later space than others, there's a lot happening in lending models, in you know, prison decision making, in that Harry and Zev start to tackle the things you're talking about, but because the risk of a decision there is so heavy and affects a human life in such a dire way, they're probably much more evolved um, in the techniques that they're deploying, which goes back to kind of Zev, your point, you know, compared to what, if the buyer has a bunch of humans who are making bad decisions left and right, and the risk profile of that decision is very low, then compared to what is minimal. If it's compared to a judge that can think about a life set sentence for a prisoner, then, you know, the compared to what is extremely high. So, I think we encounter really interesting um, conflicts in our field of trying to satisfy a buyer where an AI agenda might be new and an organization where processes are much less developed and the compared to what is, is a lower friction point. Um, and then it kind of raises a question, I think, for you both. You mentioned, Zev, you know, state laws, country laws, global UN, World Economic Forum, and, you know, ethical codes and standards. Um, and, you know, one of the questions we got was, was this notion of, um, you know, universally accepted definitions. Uh, I don't think we're going to tackle that in the remaining six minutes, but I, I am very curious from both of your perspectives. This is our second to last question. We have one more on to ending with COVID, um, but just tackling from this vantage point, whom and how do you think is best equipped to regulate or define standards? Um, is it government? Is it nonprofits? Is it the individual's building following their moral code? Is it the buyer's buying being advised and coached? So I'd love your feedbacks. Yeah, I, I saw that question. I, and I actually think it's a little bit of a rabbit hole, obviously. But um, the truth is, I mean, my, my personal belief is that it doesn't matter so much what like there are some universal standards and their debate, there's whole ethical debates about how universal are standards about, you know, the, the example of like stealing or murder, like universally accepted. But I actually think that's an irrelevant question because the devil's in the details. As I mentioned, I tried to type this answer in the thing while we were talking, but like, it doesn't really matter if we universally accept uh, or don't accept certain things. The truth is the penalties are what matter, right? Because if we have, uh, say stealing is wrong, we all agree stealing is wrong, raise your hand. Well, okay, great. Okay, but in country one for stealing, you just have to return the stolen items, but in country two, the penalty is death. I would argue that that standard is not no longer universal as evidenced by the result if you steal. So it's a little bit of a utilitarian view, but honestly, like from a rules and standards perspective as applied to AI, 
that is where it matters because it que the question ultimately is like, what models can we run? What models can't we run? What are the standards that get applied um, to review the results? Like no one cares if, if, if I run, um, you know, a CNN and, and no one cares if I'm running, no one's gonna ban running a CN, like a, one type of model or a, a deep learning model or not. What they're gonna ban is saying, if someone's are concerned about it, is anything that results in a problem. So if I have a model or if I flip a coin and I say only hire white men, that's the issue. So there's, it's just a carry forward of our existing standards and, and rules as applied. No, I don't think anyone's gonna care whether Harry runs a different model than Athena and Cindy, like no one cares if we're running different models. The question's gonna be what's the outcome? So I, I don't think it really matters so much. I don't, it's like, a, I know there are ethicists who debate universal, like, but it's kind of beyond the scope and not really relevant to what we do. I think it's not relevant to what we do. Yeah, I, I start from different angle. I, I would feel it quite uncomfortable if we take standards that you are only allowed to use this kind of methods, you are only allowed to collect this kind of data. Then we are missing all the possibilities for development in good and in bad. But, but, but definitely standard, standardizing algorithms, standardizing the rows in the database would harm the whole business really much. So the question is, like I've mentioned, the outcome and how we use the outcome. And, and, and in, in, many, in many cases, I'm, I'm not that much interested on, well, the ethics discussion is important, but I'm more interested on what concrete it brings in. Of course, don't be evil, uh, don't steal. Those are obvious, but, uh, but, but more interested, the legislation should set the minimum standards, so don't steal. And then what's the penalty if, if steal? So it's, it's the similar. In data, uh, in data side, we have GDPR in, in Europe side, in US, there are own uh, state-based laws on, on, on privacy. California has different than, than many, other, many other states. So that's, that's the minimum. But for example, in, in Europe and in, in fact globally, there is a uh, movements like my data, which, which are societies that highlight that, hey, companies, organizations, NGOs in, in this, this group, they believe that people own their data and they give consent to anyone to use it. So, so it's not nations, companies, and people, it's people only. And, and, and the question is more that how many companies, how many people start to use this kind of technologies and are, are they abandoning the technologies not using this kind of? And, and this is completely outside the question of standards and legislations. They are movements, they are about cultures. And that's why we need a mini, minimum le legislation that, uh, well, safeguards people, safeguards also the companies. So I don't say this is not only for people, but also safeguarding the companies, organizations. And then we need a freedom to develop different kinds of methods. And, and my data is one good example and movement that might really bring out something new. Great. Well, we've got, we're on the wrap. So we've got one, one minute remaining. I think it would be great to close with just you know, a, a closing word, COVID has, has obviously had dire effects on um, mass unemployment, speed and rate of change, um, other impacts, talent redeployment, re-education and upskilling, just to name a few. I think um, I would love to hear in a one, two word um, final closing, what is it that you both think is one of the most exciting areas of the application of AI in talent acquisition or in HR that has either been accelerated by or made open as a result of, of you know, what, what the world is going through? Harry, I, I don't have a strong answer on this. You yeah, I, answer. I, I don't know if I have either good answers, but I, I find it really interesting how we can uh, model people's skills and competencies in order to do quick turns in businesses. For example, companies doing clothes turn to doing protection, protection masks. And what kind of skills required? And how we can very quickly find the people to new positions in, in new structures. And that's, that's the place we, where we can use the technology for good, definitely. We have the people, we know the skills, something changed. We build the organization in a new structure in a very fast way. Applying AI, of course, decision made by people. But this is one, one very interesting scenario. Other is finding quickly gigs. If I'm good skilled, but dropped out, how I can find gigs very fast way because the company, my employer will be up 
in in a couple of months or one year. But but anyway, th these are the uh, interesting areas: quick turns, huge data, lot of uncertainty. I, I was going to say something kind of similar very quickly. It, it's the idea that there's more tolerance for a data-driven approach, very similar to what Harry said. Um, you know, I think that the need for expediency and data, but it, it juxtaposes exactly this conversation with ethics, right? So you have to trust that the data are, you know, moving in this direction is, is a form of trust because you're basically saying like, okay, well, how good can we be with pulling exactly the kind of data structures that Harry's, this, Harry is describing uh, to do things that are reasonable and good and better than before? Um, but I think, I think really we're seeing that. I think, the, I think the effect I'm seeing is like more of a tolerance or greater appreciation for the need for expedience and efficiency, but that requires data, right? So like this isn't a magic trick where you just say that, you know, the AI is just pulling things out of thin air. There has to be a training, there has to be data on which to train. Um, but I think there is a, a greater acceptance of that need um, to do it that way. Um, and, uh, you know, what data sources we use, you know, there's, I, I, in, in HR, there's three categories. There's things that l reside on the individual, there's behavioral data, and there's relational data. So I think you're going to see changes. I, I think one of the big changes you see is like the need for, frankly, more behavioral and relational data and moving relational data, how people are connect on networks, some of the data that we measure at Syndio uh, in full disclosure. But um, for sure, attribute-based data that it reside on the individual uh, is sort of not as great as behavioral and relational. Data. I think you're going to see more shifting away from that. That's one of the effects. Well, thank you guys so much for such an exciting discussion and such a hard topic. And uh, I think especially those closing words have left us with an understanding of potentially some good that might come out of what um, so many are going through. So uh, a pleasure and, and thank you for TA Tech for hosting us.